Well, welcome back everyone to day three of Inspire. I hope you were all able to attend yesterday, day before. If not, those recordings and materials will be available on our event hub site. That's the case for today's session and all of the sessions at Inspire as well. My name is Terry Martin. I'm with NAPSIC Foundation. I, along with my colleagues, Charlotte Abel, Jared Doak, and Trisha Lawson will be facilitating the session, monitoring for your questions that you post and sharing all of your comments from the chat. So thank you for joining us for the session, Innovations in Community Resilience. I am particularly excited about this next 90 minutes. This topic really kind of culminates all that the summit is about. We're going to hear about data getting developed and shared and utilized to support analysis and inform community planning, preparedness activities, and actually drive change through policies and community action. So before we get started, I would be remiss if I didn't mention a really valuable resource, and that is the Resilient Network Partnership, no, Resilient Nation Partnership Network. If you're not yet familiar, they are a tremendous network of organizations working to help communities take action and become more resilient. And it was through our involvement with them that we have learned about the work being done by our speakers today. So I did want to mention that effort and really encourage you to get on their email list. So some of you may have learned about Inspire from their newsletter, which you can see here on the right. Um, so we're getting, uh, we'll put in that chat, uh, that link in the chat for you to grab so you can uh, learn more. So for today, this is our agenda for the next 90 minutes. If you haven't heard, the National Risk Index was released recently. So we're excited to have Casey Zuzak from FEMA's Natural Hazards Risk Assessment Program here to share the latest on the NRI. We have Derek Hebert, formerly with King County, Washington, who was a significant force behind the county's regional hazard mitigation plan and its focus on equity. And lastly, we have Lisa Foster from Pinellas County, Florida, who is going to share their work on sea level rise and storm surge vulnerability, and their planning efforts that go far into the future to protect people and infrastructure. And lastly, with us today to moderate our session, we're excited to have Kevin Mickey, Director of Professional Development and Geospatial Technologies Education at the Polis Center and Applied Research Center at IUPUI School of Informatics and Community Computing. He is also the current president of URESA and former chair of URESA's Community Resilience Committee. He has over three decades of experience supporting communities through the modeling of natural hazard risk. So I've had the pleasure of working with you, Kevin, mostly learning from you for many years now. Uh, so I'm thrilled to have you with us, particularly as I know this is a topic that you're quite passionate about. So excited to have you moderate this session. Um, I will drive, but I will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Terry. It is a pleasure to be here this morning. And you're absolutely right. This is a topic that I'm very passionate about. And I know that everyone that's uh, on this panel is equally. Um, what I want to do for just a few moments or minutes is share a little bit about the work that, that ERISA is doing in this area. Um, I suspect many of you are familiar with ERISA as an organization. It's been around for over five decades. Um, connecting people and uh, resources of many different types within the geospatial community. And uh, certainly an important part of that community is, is the, the segment that works with issues related to public safety. Um, we've been doing a great deal of work in that area, uh, especially over the last three years. Um, and I wanna share just a little bit of that. Uh, Terry, can we switch the slides, please? There we go. So you can break your RISA's uh, activities down into, I think, these four different categories. Uh, we have a very significant commitment to education and providing resources that comes about in the form of webinars, uh, workshops, um, ongoing activities um, uh, of an educational nature, such as various conferences. We usually do multiple conferences per year. We've gotten very good at virtual conferences like this one, um, as we all have over the past year and, and look to build on that. Um, ERISA plays a very important role, I believe, in serving as an advocate for uh, geospatial professionals. We keep an eye on um, legislation and policies at uh, local, state, and federal levels, and act as the voice or a voice, a strong voice for the geospatial community, including uh, everyone represented in this conference, I believe. Uh, ERISA very much appreciates the contributions of uh, its members and others within the profession that, that um, uh, serve the roles that are so important through volunteer activities and, and other work. So we offer a variety of scholarships, awards, and different types of recognition. 
And HERISA is a volunteer-based organization, and we believe in engaging our community. Uh, so there's a lot of different opportunities to connect and to contribute through uh, what I believe are currently roughly 19 different committees that are extremely active, working on uh, dozens of initiatives uh, within the organization. Uh, as president, I'm very proud to be affiliated with this organization, and, and the biggest reason is because of the enthusiasm and commitment of its volunteers. Uh, Terry, can we switch again, please? What I want to focus on, I could talk about your RISA for hours, uh, but what I want to focus on, which is most relevant to this particular audience, is um, the committee that we have called the Community Resilience Committee. This is um, a group of, of stakeholders that uh, includes representatives from different government agencies, local government, private sector, uh, not-for-profits, and a variety of others, and we're always looking to expand, uh, that is taking action to enhance resilience, especially at the local level. Uh, that committee has produced a lot of different things over the last couple of years uh, since it began. Uh, but it focuses on these three areas, educational products, best practices, and various types of tools. I want to share just a little bit about what we've done uh, within that area. If we could switch our slide. One good example is uh, an initiative that the committee set off right after it was uh, kicked off, and this was early in 2018, 2019. They did a, a survey uh, that involved several hundred individuals asking questions about how organizations and uh, either use or would like to use geospatial tools and techniques to inform as well as advance community resilience to disasters. Uh, we had a lot of great feedback. The information that was collected, uh, you can see the sources from which it came here on this map, but the information uh, is accessible in a number of different forms through your RISA's tools uh, that anyone can get to. We go to the next slide, please. Another thing that we've been very excited to be involved with, and, and this is a, a central mission for the organization, is, is a collaboration uh, with our partners here at NAPSIG, uh, through which we developed a risk resilience and vulnerability analysis, indices analysis. Uh, that project looked at available as well as emerging resilience and vulnerability indices that are extremely important to helping the emergency management community match their business needs with different indices. There are a lot of different options out there. Uh, we took a great deal of time to look at those options uh, and identify what happens at each. Uh, so that information is available on the NAPSIG website. Let's turn our page again, please. Here's a variety of other accomplishments of the task force. Um, another great partnership is one that has is ongoing actually between NAPSIG, uh, ERISA, and uh, our, our sister organization, the National States Geographic Information Council, uh, through which we developed a pandemic task force. And the mission of that group is to uh, provide guidance on how geospatial technologies both can and should be used to support a pandemic, obviously a timely topic. This is one of many different initiatives that ERISA is involved in related to the pandemic. I've listed a couple of recent publications of, of many that we have actually through this committee and, and others within the organization. Um, and we've also supported a lot of different workshops, panels, and so forth with ERISA's annual GIS Pro Conference, the next one of which is coming up in October, we hope, in a face-to-face -face fashion. Next slide, please. So the committee has a lot of great ideas moving forward, and, and based on their enthusiasm of, of the past, I have no doubt will be very successful. There's a number of articles uh, that are in the queue right now. There's plans to put on quarterly webinars. Uh, additional collaborations are always something that we seek. Uh, and we even have two brand new working groups of very enthusiastic um, contributors working on uh, the relationship between climate change and community equity and uh, community resilience and sectoral dependencies. Uh, we can switch our slide one more time, Terry. So again, I could talk about ERISA for a very long time, as you can imagine, but we have three fantastic speakers that I want to introduce now and uh, have them tell you all about the great work that they've been doing. Uh, the first one is Mr. Casey Zuzak. Uh, Casey's a senior risk analyst for HAZUS and the Natural Hazards Risk Assessment Program in FEMA, uh, which is in the Risk Management Directorate. Uh, he's also lead for the National Risk Index, which he'll be talking to us about this morning. Uh, and NRAP provides natural hazard risk assessments, data, tools, and analysis to support the FEMA strategic goals and the development 
of risk communication. Casey's worked for FEMA since 2011 and has a, a master's degree in geography from the University of South Carolina. Casey, I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation. I'm sure everyone is, so take it away. All right, good morning, everyone, and thanks for the introduction, Kevin. Uh, this morning, I'm going to talk about FEMA's National Risk Index, or a way for us to start discovering the landscape of natural hazard risk across the country. The National Risk Index began as a way for FEMA to start understanding how we can reduce costs around risk assessment to support mitigation planning, community planning, and other prioritization efforts. Um, it, the National Risk Index provides a pre-calculated top-down baseline risk assessment that e allows communities to easily, easily identify areas of, of high return mitigation investments and again, to prioritize different mitigation actions. The National Risk Index is the first freely available, consistent, and comprehensive risk assessment product at a nationwide level that looks at multiple hazards, as well as incorporates social vulnerability and community resilience. Um, different programs are able to leverage the National Risk Index and to have a an initial baseline of credible risk information, risk assessment information, or leverage the NRI to build off and create their own um, enhanced version. It provides a mechanism for us to start incorporating and talking about social equity and future conditions within, within FEMA, um, leveraging the National Risk Index, as well as having effective dialogue around an all hazards approach to mitigation. Within FEMA and especially in the risk map program, our primary goal is to work with communities to buy down their risk from the flood hazard. However, when we have our multiple community meetings, communities are not interested in just, just talking about flood. Flood is the mechanism for us to have these conversations, but quickly the conversations go to other hazards that are impacted by the community, like earthquakes on the West Coast, tornadoes in the, in the Great Plains and hurricanes on the East Coast. The National Risk Index allows FEMA to go into these communities, or as we're in, you know, talking to the communities about the floodplain mapping program, to have more insight and information into you know, what, what risks are most impactful for communities so that we're prepared to have effective conversations. As we built the National Risk Index, we, we didn't want to develop something that was siloed within FEMA. We worked with local and state partners as well as regional government. Uh, we uh, worked very closely with our other federal partner agencies, academia, the private industry, and nonprofit organizations to build the NRI. This is just a group, or a, you know, a quick snapshot of some of the groups that we worked with with the National Risk Index as we developed the product. Um, we worked with our partners at CDM Smith, ABS, AECOM, and um, Factor. We also engaged our, our partners in our federal partners like the US Forest Service, USGS, and National Drought Mitigation Center, and NOAA to name a few, and engaged academic organizations like the University of South Carolina, Arizona State, LSU, uh, UC Boulder, and Central Florida. So we really wanted to make sure that we brought as many contributors to the table. To do this and bring everyone together effectively, we, we created several different working groups. The first was the Natural Hazards Working Group. And this working group was tasked with identifying which hazards should be included in the National Risk Index and what data would be the most appropriate to bring in from a hazard perspective. Um, so we, I, when I say we, I mean I, reviewed the 50 state mitigation plans that were available online at the time. And we did a frequency analysis to understand which hazards were most, most often profiled. This gave us an understanding really quickly of which hazards were most important to the states across the country. So if the hazard was included in at least 50% of the state mitigation plans or a regional significant event, like a volcano, tsunami, or hurricane, we felt it was important to include in the National Risk Index. We also limited it to just um, natural hazards. So we didn't include any man-made hazards or anthropogenic hazards as well. Um, and we also wanted to leverage nationally available data sets. So uh, we leveraged data from the National Hurricane Center, NOAA, Storms Prediction Center, um, National Drought Mitigation Center, and NEHRP, to name a few. 
Our second working group was centered around social vulnerability and community resilience. This working group was charged with first helping us understand if we should include just social vulnerability or community resilience, or if we needed to include both factors. Um, that was quickly um, answered. And the answer was both. It's important to include both because they measure very different aspects. Social vulnerability helps us to understand which communities may be disproportionately impacted by a, nat by a natural event, natural hazard. And community resilience allows us to understand how communities are able to recover after an event. Um, for social vulnerability, the working group recommended that we move forward with the Social Vulnerability Index, or SOVI, from the University of South Carolina as, as the uh, social vulnerability indicators. And for community resilience, it was recommended that we leverage their BRIC index, or the baseline resilience indicators for communities, uh, to, which complements the SOVI index as well. Our third working group was was tasked with how do we bring all of this information together and then how do we display it in a way that makes sense to users. Um, so within the National Risk Index, we broadly define risk as the product of the expected annual loss, social vulnerability, and inverse of community resilience, where social or expected annual loss is defined as the product of the natural hazard exposure, hazard frequency, and its historic loss ratio. This allows us to bring in the information to create an expected annual loss dollar value and then understand how the impacts of social vulnerability and community resilience impact the risk. So does that increase or decrease a community's risk based upon its um, social vulnerability and community, fa community resilience factors? To break this down a little bit further, uh, within the expected annual loss, we look at the annual frequency or the rate of the occurrence, or how often does the hazard occur in an area. For the exposure, we look at three different factors, property value or building value, people in terms of fatalities, and agriculture, which brings together both livestock and crop impacts. So this allows us to understand what's in the way of the hazard for all three different factors. And then we also look at the historic loss or how bad has the hazard been in a given area? Is every hurricane a billion dollar loss? Does every lightning strike or one out of every 50,000 lightning strikes cause a fatality? Uh, what are the historic losses to crops as it relates to drought? This allows us to answer some of those questions. Before we jump into a snapshot of the ratings, uh, one thing I wanted to talk about is the NRI does provide a relative risk score. So when you see the National Risk Index score, it is a relative value. So it allows us to compare locations across the country where the expected annual loss value is an actual dollar rating on an annual basis. So this allows us to see areas across the country which may have the highest losses and highest impacts um, from an event on an annual basis. And it's important to remember the, the expected annual loss is an annualized value, uh, where the National Risk Index score is a relative ranking, like social vulnerability and community resilience. We also provide both the expected annual loss scores and the National Risk Index scores uh, for the 18 individual hazards, as well as a combined or a composite score uh, for both. So this allows users to one, identify quickly where they have the highest uh, risk to natural hazards overall, as well as the highest expected annual losses at the county and census tract level. And then it'll, it also allows users to dive deeper into understanding which hazards may be most impactful to their community. And further, we, we provide additional information to help understand is it frequency, is it exposure, um, has the community experienced high historical losses. From here, users are or we provide um, users access to other tools like FEMA's RAP tool, uh, which help or risk analysis preparedness tool, which helps users understand more about what's in the way of the hazard or the exposure component. Um, and through their tool, users are able to access up to 300 different layers of census information and high field open data. Also, a community score, again, it describes its relative position to all other communities in the components. Um, so with, 
within the NRI score, it ranges from very low to very high. Um, and so there's no specific numeric values, but more of a comparative rating. So here's what the, the scores look like. Uh, the top row is by county, the bottom row is by census tract. On the left, we see the highest or the expected annual loss rating or that annualized dollar value. And on the right, we see the risk rating or what happens when we bring in the social vulnerability and community resilience components. Uh, some areas to highlight is Northwest Arizona and uh, Southwest South Dakota. This, these are communities that we, that we know are highly social vulnerable, highly socially vulnerable and have a low community resilience. And we can see that within the expected annual loss rating, they may not have, they have a very low rating, uh, which means that they don't have um, a high dollar annualized loss. But once we bring in the social vulnerability and community resilience factors, this helps us um, make sure that these communities are rated uh, where they should be. So their ratings go from a low, very low to a moderate risk because they, they are very at risk communities. Um, based upon their social vulnerability and community resilience. Finally, uh, the stakeholders of the NRI vary. Uh, there's a large number of groups that are interested in using the National Risk Index. It can be used to inform long-term and community recovery, enhance mitigation uh, plans, and help to help prioritize mitigation actions. It can be leveraged by communities to help develop increased codes and standards. Um, we know we know increased codes and standards help reduce disaster impacts in the long run. The National Risk Index can help us understand which communities have a high risk to specific natural hazards and may not have up-to-date building codes uh, to reflect the potential impacts of those hazards. It also allows for us to, to do an increased and targeted community engagement and outreach to individual homeowners so that we're communicating the risk to not only um, one hazard, but to all hazards across the country. The National Risk Index was, the data were released um, in November 2020 through our phase one application. And this is an ArcGIS online tool that allows users to understand more about how we created the NRI data, visualize both the composite um, expected annual loss and National Risk Index scores at the county or census tract level, and download all data um, associated, associated with the NRI. Um, so we're super excited about that. The, what I'm more excited about is our full application release, which is tentatively scheduled for this summer. Um, and we, ex we expect it to roll out um, again in summer 2021. And with that, there are four enhancements. One is users will have more access and easier access to robust information about how we developed each of the individual hazard layers and what went into creating the risk scores. Second, there will be um, the ability to visualize each of the individual 18 hazard layers in both the expected annual loss and community resilience. This really helps communities um, that may not have the ability to visualize the products currently, but to dive in and understand more about their individual risk to natural hazards. Um, Third, we are producing a PDF reports for either counties or census tract or multiple counties and census tracts. This allows users to um, quickly identify and understand impacts um, from the different hazards and understand more about their inherent risk and what's potentially driving the risk to natural hazards. And fourth, we're producing some data updates. Uh, around the historic loss ratio, we're bringing in three additional data sets or three years of additional data to include 2017, 18, and 19. We are also updating our landslide frequency database uh, to add three more years to the, the historic frequency. And third, we're revisioning how we calculated the tornado um, expected annual loss rating by connecting tornadoes to, to losses. So we're doing our, our best to bring together and understand how each tornado's, tornadoes impact communities. So uh, really excited for that to come out um, this summer. So I'll go ahead and pause there. Um, I don't remember if I'm supposed to open it for questions now or if we're holding questions to the end, Terry and Kevin. Terry, I'll, actually, I'll Casey, yeah, we, 
we, we do have some time for questions, and I'm not surprised to say we do have some questions. Thanks for this presentation, Casey. This has been very good. And let me let me throw some questions at you. And for everyone, we're going to try to get to every question during this session, but we want to make sure that we also leave time for the presentation since there's such great information to be shared. Uh, for those questions that aren't answered during the session, uh, NAPSIC will try to uh, work with the presenters to get some responses to you post-conference. So let me just uh, pick some here. Uh, Daniel, let's, let's start out with one from you. Uh, Casey, Daniel asks, are there plans to include some of the hazards that were excluded from the initial analysis, such as dam failure? And uh, also, how often is the data updated? Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Those are those are really good questions. And uh, real quick, if I'm not able to get to your question today, feel or if you have any additional questions afterwards, feel free to reach out to um, myself at FEMA-NRI at FEMA.DHS.gov, and I'm I'm happy to answer any questions at, later as well. Um, so I'm going to jump back to that slide really quick, um, just to talk through the the different hazards. So we did not include dam failure and levee failure. Um, dam failure information is very difficult to receive and it's often not in geospatial formats. It's in PDF reports and it's very specific to each dam. Um, so there's not a, there is no centralized database that helps us understand uh, the impacts of the dam failure. As much as we would love to include it, um, until there's a more robust database, I, I don't know if we'll be able to. Also, one thing that was very important to the, the development team was to make sure that we had the application 100% open, free, and public. And for that, dam information is often not freely and publicly available or publicly available. Um, so we didn't want to bring that in and risk having to add a credentialing to the, the application. And some of the other hazards like expansive soils, erosion, um, subsidence, we would love to include that information, um, but some of it is, you know, based upon data availability. Um, subsidence, the national data set that we were hoping to leverage hadn't been updated in almost 30 years. Um, also, there's no one robust data set at the national level. There are some individual databases, like there's an amazing database for subsidence in Florida. Um, but that only exists for Florida. So it makes it really challenging to bring together at the national level. Uh, we do hope to include other hazards in the future um, as data becomes available. Uh, we also are looking to incorporate uh, climate change and future, condition, future, future building conditions as well into the NRI. Thanks, Casey. There's a couple of related questions here. I'm going to combine these. Um, both essentially are asking, are there different vehicles through which the information through the, the NRI could be consumed? Is there an API available? Are there uh, web feature service plans, for example? Are there other ways that you anticipate making this information accessible beyond the website? Yes. Um, it was very, again, it was very important to us to make sure all of the data were readily available. We provide all of the national risk index data free of charge and we provide it at the county census tract and tribal levels. It's also provided in tabular CSV formats. It's provided in spatial shape files, and it's also available through uh, REST services and feature access services. So users have the ability to consume the information in multiple ways, either geospatial or non-geospatial formats. Um, all of that is available through our current tool. So if you go to fema.gov slash NRI, um, there, there's a giant blue button that allows you to access the application and all of the data are available at the national level through our information page, which is the first tab that pops up or the data download tab. If you have an ArcGIS online account, it allows you to create a, a site or a specific selection of data. Great information, and I'm, I'm actually really curious about this one myself. Are there plans to incorporate any of the territories like Puerto Rico, for example? Yes, um, that, that's a really good question and something that we really are looking to do. Um, the challenge with bringing in the territories um, in the, at least the initial round was data are not equitably, equitably, equitably available throughout um, the three Pacific territories and the USVI in Puerto Rico. Um, also what defines social vulnerability and community resilience 
in the in the territories are are very different than what defines it across the U.S. So um, there are some challenges to bringing in the data, and we are really hoping to do so in the future. Um, we we've identified a few subject matter experts um, in. Puerto Rico and the U.S. of Virgin Islands that um, are able to help provide some additional data uh, that will help us increase the capacity and build out the national risk index for, for those areas. But if there are any, um, any subject matter experts that are willing to support, uh, we'd love to have, have your input and support in developing the NRI for, for the territories. And, and I did wanna do a, a quick plug for the FEMAS has this program. Uh, we, we have expanded all of the data to the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, and it will be available on our HAZIS 5.0 release, which is scheduled for at the end of April. So we're, we're super, super excited about that. We're able to leverage data uh, from the, the recent hurricane seasons to develop damage functions uh, that are specific to the island territories. So um, more to come on that. Perfect. Uh, I know I'm very excited about that. As you know, Casey, there's a lot of great things happening with Hassas coming down the road. I um, think we might have time for just one more question. There's, there's, there's some great questions, and I really appreciate the audience uh, putting those into the, the Q&A. These are very helpful, and I think everyone's benefiting from them. Um, we have a question from Zan. Uh, Casey, would, is it correct to say that, and Zan, I'm going to paraphrase this, that the index might show a low score, but that doesn't necessarily mean that a large event um, can't happen in those locations. Uh, that a low score could be an indication of lots of different factors that indicate that the population is resilient. Hopefully, I paraphrase yes, that. Yes, that, well. that is correct. Um, a, a res, you know, a community that may have not experienced a a massive or a large scale disaster. Um, or it may not have been recorded in the last 50 years or available through you know, the historic record may not appear as high risk. One event um, may not drive a community's risk to a natural hazard. Um, that, that is one limitation with the NRI um, is that it, it do, we do our best to look back at the historic data to make sure that we're defining risk um, across the country. So if it's a, a disaster that we may not have had before, or if it's you know something like Hurricane Sandy, where we may not have had that type of storm in, it, in I don't want to say in the history, but uh, recorded in the databases like NOAA's NCEI storm data reports, um, it's hard to capture those data. Um, it's also hard to capture historic losses on events that um, were prior to 1995, just because data collection and data inventorying and data um, reporting were just not the same as what it is now. Um, data availability is just one of the challenges. We may be able to capture it in the frequency and the exposure and through um, how we are applying the historic losses through Bayesian credibility theory um, across the country. So we do our best to capture it that way. Uh, but you're right, we may not be capturing one specific event in an area so we may be showing it as a lower risk um, than what you know that event would would do. So um, once we have more information, you know we're continually working to refine. I know one of the questions I didn't answer is what is the update cycle. Yeah. Um, you know we we're continually working to update data within the NRI as new historic data become available or new data becomes available. Uh, we know we have an update related to the 2020 census. Um, that's going to update all of the, pretty much all of the layers because new information will be available. Um, that's unfortunately not available yet. Hopefully it's available in, in September so we can work on updating the data related to that. Yeah, and, and Casey, in closing, we need to, to move on to our next presentation, but I think one of the, the things that most interests me on this particular product is that it is intended to be dynamic. It's not a snapshot in time that doesn't get updated and its, its existence in a web-based environment, uh, pulling information that, that is updated on an ongoing basis, I think brings the value of this really to the forefront. So I uh, appreciate your time. We do have um, a little bit of time built in at the end, if we can keep on schedule. So for those of you whose questions we did not get to, we will try to do so a little bit later. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to our next presentation. Uh, our next presenter is Derek Hybert. Uh, Derek is the former hazard mitigation strategist 
for King County Emergency Management in Washington. Uh, he is currently an advisory specialist master in the crisis and resilience area of Deloitte and Touche. Uh, Derek is an emergency manager and hazard mitigation specialist. As I said, formerly with King County, where at that time he coordinated and wrote the regional hazard mitigation plan that included over 50 different local partners, as well as leading regional efforts to maximize mitigation opportunities through FEMA's BRIC program. Uh, the work of Derek and his team has been held up as a model for incorporating equity and social justice into hazard mitigation and for prioritizing mitigation that explicitly benefits vulnerable communities. Derek, we appreciate you being here today and look forward to your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kevin. Uh, very nice to be here. Um, thank you very much, Terry, for all organizing this. Uh, I'm excited to have a chance to to talk to folks today. I do miss being in person uh, and seeing everybody's uh, faces and getting a chance to talk afterwards, but uh, you can always uh, reach out to me. My uh, the contact information for all the panelists, I think, is at the end. So, um, hazard mitigation. So, I, I, I have been working at hazard mitigation planning for a number of years now. Uh, and my focus has been, has grown from being uh, primarily focused on identifying risks and hazards, I think, like everyone else did back in the, you know, 2010s, to trying to actually turn those risks and hazards and that understanding of risks and hazards to something a little bit more uh, meaningful to a community. And when we distill down a community's relationship to risk and vulnerability, their relationship to hazards, we understand that by and large, um, we have we try to learn to live with our environment to the extent we can, change it to the extent we can, you know, try to build in our own forms of, of some kind of mitigation by maybe building a little bit stronger or uh, building, you know, levees or, or other structures that help reduce our risk. And that's what we do naturally. But we also know that those same kinds of actions put us in the way of truly catastrophic losses when a disaster does occur. So then in a modern context, I think hazard mitigation is really the way we take the edge off of catastrophes and make them survivable. So what, what we are trying to do when we think about this is we're trying to think about, we've got, we know we can't really recover effectively from a catastrophe. If you look around the country, communities don't usually recover from catastrophic losses. Um, if they have uh, some kind of recovery, it's usually not the people that were there before. And our objective is to make it possible for communities to recover and ensure that they can recover with the same people there. And when, that, when we're talking about Washington State or King County, what that means is earthquakes. That means a catastrophic Cascadia subduction zone or Seattle Fault earthquake that causes uh, hundreds to potentially thousands of fatalities uh, far more injuries, uh, billions and billions of dollars uh, in econ and economic and physical losses. Um, but also, I think more importantly, um, potentially uh, eliminates the region's ability to be productive and successful in the intermediate term. Um, we're looking at losses of, of up to 70% of our bridges at the within the first few days after a Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. Um, that is not to say that that the bridges could, some of those wouldn't go back online, but it does mean that in the first hours and mid days after an earthquake, it is impossible for us to conduct effective response and recovery operations. I, and I think, I think understanding the severity and the um, really the, 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 the true nature of these events is important because it also starts talking about who's vulnerable to events, who's likely to suffer losses and recover slowly. And also it talks about what is the consequence of a hazard, not just in terms of dollar losses, but in terms of what it, the loss means to the community. I uh, was inspired a number of years ago reading a historic preservation article written by uh, someone who was with FEMA at the time and had been a graduate thesis in it. And it was talking about the loss of historic buildings in Louisiana, Mississippi and uh, uh, town in Mississippi towns after Hurricane Katrina and previous hurricanes when due to just limitations on, on accessibility, buildings that may have been able to be saved, historic buildings, historic downtowns were lost. And with them was lost that kind of the soul of that community, those central features that made that place special and unique and identifiable. And those things are not things that we can afford to lose. And so a hazard mitigation then becomes a question of, well, how do you protect what you most love about your community? Well, then there's this third piece here, which is, 
who do you protect in your community and how do you understand the consequences to hazards to different parts of your community? How do you not just protect what's important in your community, but how do you ensure that everybody has a voice in deciding what's perfect, what's, what's, what's important? So kind of to take a step back then, hazard mitigation is how we take the edges off catastrophes and make them survivable. Hazard mitigation is the tool that we can use to address, to protect those things that we love. Hazard mitigation hazards, we know disasters widen the gaps between communities and leave some places with either more losses or longer delayed recoveries. So I should say for us, when we say vulnerable, we mean likelihood of loss and likelihood of delayed recovery. Um, it's important for our context that we define vulnerable because vulnerable is gonna differ depending on the context um, that you're talking about. If you're a sociologist, or if, if you're talking about uh, say, um, vulnerable children as a social worker, that's a little bit different than if you're talking about uh, vulnerable communities from a uh, natural hazard standpoint. Because unless you have the combination of exposure and susceptibility to the thing that can occur, then you're not, you're not really vulnerable to that hazard. Um, and that is one of the limitations of, of, in my opinion, things like the social vulnerability index is that you're kind of intrinsically or innately vulnerable by your characteristics. Um, and that includes the hazards, which can be a bit challenging. So King County's re Regional Hazard Mitigation Plan was written with the understanding that emergency managers as a matter of professional standard should address the greatest sources of loss in our community. This means we have to consider social vulnerability. This means we have to look at how we prioritize and invest in communities. And this means that it's not sufficient to uh, simply do a risk assessment, figure out what the highest dollar, potential dollar value loss is, and kind of move forward with that. Um, the other piece is, since we care about investing in things that are important to the community, it means that we need to think about investments not in terms of necessarily only individual pieces of infrastructure, like a single bridge or a road. And in fact, bridges and roads don't take center stage in the King County Regional Plan. What takes, single, what takes center stage for us are what we call the 14 determinants of equity. These are measures that the county had already adopted as upstream components of quality of life, things that failure to invest in results in downstream negative impact. Vulnerability here is a result of not having enough of these things up here. And mitigation is an inherently upstream function, right? So we're looking at, a, at something that reduces long-term future risk and we do it by reducing exposure and vulnerability in advance. And so it kind of fit very well with this particular model. It also has the benefits of being something that was countywide and already adopted. And it helps us demonstrate the value of mitigation, not in terms of roads and bridges, but in terms of transportation, in terms of safe and effective, um, uh, safe and efficient transportation, quality housing, community and public safety, uh, economic development, um, you know, strong and vibrant neighborhoods, school quality education. Like, well, how does how does mitigation invest in quality education? Well, it does it by making sure the schools are able to withstand catastrophic events, to provide a sense of normalcy for kids once they've returned. That those that the schools that are highest quality and most capable of withstanding an earthquake or another kind of incident are uh, fairly and equitably accessible to all people, regardless of of various vulnerability factors. And um, that is how we invest in quality education from a mitigation perspective. It also makes these things living. And I gotta tell you, infrastructure should and must be thought of as living. It is, it underpins so much of the prosperity in this country and the differences we see both in prosperous neighborhoods versus not. And those, and those communities that um, have, uh, and, and in access in, in terms of both in prosperous neighborhoods and not, and in the historical growth of what is prosperity has a lot to do with what places got invested in from an infrastructure perspective. I, um, you know, this is not this is not a political statement, but I have been very happy with the way the um, administration has been talking about infrastructure as a living and breathing thing in the in this uh, multi-trillion-dollar uh, bill that's been proposed because. That is fundamentally understanding what it is. It is not a bridge, road, road and a bridge. It is access to medical, safe, to, to, to hospitals and, and, and uh, health systems. It is access to um, quality uh, schools. It has a value to a community that goes beyond 
what it is. And mitigation as the tool that we use to invest in these things is a really great way that we have to strengthen those values. So we've got the plan that's, and we've, we're going to invest, we're going to basically funct structure it so that we invest in um, these components of quality of life. And then it comes a question of, well, how are we supposed to know which projects are going to be the most effective and benefit the most? So that's where we got into the question of how we look at hazards and vulnerability and how we prioritize um, hazards or risk and uh, or investments in, in those. Um, so first and foremost, when it comes to how we do risk assessments, we did a couple of things that were, I don't know, how, I, I, they're a little bit novel if you look at mitigation planning as overall, but uh, maybe not um, truly, uh, maybe there are other places that do it. And the first one was um, we, we built our risk assessments as, as risk profiles and we focused in on what the hazard is, of course, but we also highlighted priority vulnerabilities. We highlighted likely sources of loss. We, and we broke our risk profiles down by the differential impacts to things like health systems, vulnerable populations, property, the environment, the economy. Um, we were an e emergency management accredited, accredited program, that uh, the accreditation standard. So we kind of had to do that to an extent, but we've expanded on that a bit and tried to focus in on this question of how does a hazard impact things we care about across different sectors? How do we get away from general statements and get to the specific and move away from kind of numbers as a tool for telling us what's wrong and get toward a place where we can understand qualitatively and quantitatively, but also uh, understand in terms of all phases of emergency management, the consequences of a disaster. Because ultimately we need to be able to be more effective at delivering emergency management resources to communities more likely to suffer losses and recover slowly at all phases of, of the disaster. And the under and the re, hazard mitigation plan risk assessment needs to help you do that. And so it, we have it has roles from mitigation through recovery. Um, we also build mitigation strategies in more strategic, uh, what we would call like a strategic planning kind of format, where basically instead of being a single a whole bunch of line item actions, we look at a comprehensive risk. We look at something, for example, like um, uh, uh, let's see, upgrade King County's wastewater treatment facilities so that they are um, resilient to uh, climate, the impacts of climate change um, within the next 20 years. There's probably, you know, 20 different strategies under there or actions under this one strategy, but because of, but, but they are necessary if we're going to achieve some degree of resilience to, to the impacts of climate and sea level rise on our wastewater treatment system. And again, this and so we step back and we say, okay, so now we've looked at the we've looked at these risks and vulnerability hazards. We've looked at the kinds of things we might want to do. We've looked at the populations that we're interested in, and we've done this over an entire region. And we've got 50 different jurisdictional partners each doing this, uh, which is common. So what you end up with in a in a multi-jurisdictional plan in a place like King County, which is the 12th largest county in the country, is a whole lot of special purpose districts and cities participating. You've got the county risk as well, and you're trying to organize this. And so what we do, do is we say, well, let's get, we have our top level risk profiles where we are, are looking a little bit more broad. And then below them, they're looking a little bit more uh, focused in on the individual and personalized risks for each community. And that is entirely qualitative, mostly, uh, mostly qualitative, where we basically are focused in instead there on trying to understand the particulars of risk. So all of this is to improve the, the likelihood that projects get completed and that the projects that are completed benefit the communities that need it. Um, in, in our context, what that looked like was um, we, and I, and I apologize, by the way, for not having slides. I, uh, there are some limitations to being a private sector person. And one of them is you have to run slides by your qualitative, uh, your, your quality and resource management people. and I did not have the time to do that before this, but um, I do have, but what I wanted to, to add there was that we've got um, a, you've got to, you've got to prioritize your risks, your hazard mitigation strategies in a way that ensures that they're likely to benefit the populations and what that you're trying to address, but you cannot use basic 
vulnerability assessments as a tool to prioritize a lot of these strategies because that doesn't they don't work that way so for example if i have a wastewater treatment strategy and i want to do a project in wastewater and i want to prioritize it um if i i can't really use a location-based assessment of vulnerability necessarily as a way to identify where that whether or not i should do that project it can't be purely based on locations and it ends up having to be focused a little bit more on the values that 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 project is supposed to provide to the communities in question. Again, we're trying to invest in these 14 determinants of equity, and we're trying to ensure that projects that have explicit benefits to vulnerable populations go forward. So what we did was develop a, seri a uh, series of, of uh, criteria that are based more, a little bit more on values in order to evaluate our mitigation strategies. Um, and this would have been probably in, in, 20, in August of 2019. And I'll tell you because uh, one of the, the great one of the, the great things that that has come about in the past few years is with um, is the FEMA Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program, and the fact that when as BRIC worked on, as the as the BRIC program was developed, it actually engaged a lot of locals, and so um, and among among them us, and uh, it was very exciting to see a lot of the suggestions that we and others provided make it into the final program. And one of the pro elements of this is is actually the prioritization of higher vulnerability communities. So what we did is we used the factors to prioritize equity in, in King County, we used a series of factors. First and foremost was um, what is, does the project explicitly benefit populations more likely to suffer loss and then recover more slowly? Um, does the project have uh, in, include partnerships with the community and neighboring jurisdictions and other entities? Does the project resilient to climate and future conditions, both climate and development? Um, does, is the project um, shovel ready? So it's likely to have already overcome some of the major hurdles. Does the project have, has the project already overcome um, or has the project effective? So is it uh, highly, is it the most effective solution for that particular project? Um, and then we also look at uh, whether or not the project is uh, has multiple benefits. So if it if it has benefits outside of risk risk and vulnerability reduction to the built environment alone, um, either pro equity or otherwise, then it gets extra points. And we scored it this way, and then it will roll up to the state and then federal level. Ultimately, um, we try to provide a little bit of direction on the projects that we do, as well as internal to King County projects, ensuring that these that we score projects correctly. Because the truth is that in the history of public works in this country, priority has had a lot more to do with what um, gets done than total resources. Um, there's never gonna be enough money. There's always another project someone can conceive of to spend money. And if, But if your project is not the priority, then it will not get done. And by virtue of the definition, I guess I'll say, of marginalized or vulnerable or underrepresented populations, the things that are most beneficial and most important to those communities oftentimes are just not priorities. And that result, that has resulted in compounding of hazard inequity over decades. And so if you're going to want to overcome the compounding of hazard inequity over decades, you've got to invest more in those places, but you can't do it as a single push. So we know that a pro equity grant program that gives $10 million to a community might sound nice from a political standpoint, but it's not likely to have long term lasting impacts. Not only because a large influx of capital is really hard to spend over a short period of time, the government does, simply doesn't doesn't have the capability to administer that many grants over a short period of time. So the money gets wasted. Uh, or at least not spent in its highest and best use, but also um, because this is a qu really a question of sustained investment. So take a look at our at these maps here um, on on the right. Thank you very much, Tari, for switching to these. Um, what we have done here is broken out variables that are associated in some cases with hazard and risk. For example, uh, disability is one of the is the primary driver behind fatalities in most major incidents. Um, if you look at Katrina, I think it was 90% of fatalities were people with some kind of disability. Uh, we've got hazard components, liquefaction potential, which is a uh, proxy for earthquake risk. So we all have earthquake risk, but um, the peak ground accelerations are usually giant circles. So it doesn't really help from an assessment standpoint. 
but the uh, liquefaction potential has a lot to do with, with the stability of buildings and the likelihood of survival in those areas. We've got median household income, which is associated with risk of, with likelihood of recovery. We've got home ownership um, rates. And we, of course, and I have put in here as an example, uh, percent people of color. Now, the SOV is interesting because it, it, the way it looks at percent people of color is it breaks it up by ethnic groups. So if you have um, a larger proportion of population that's Asian or Asian American, your area is considered less vulnerable. And if you have a percent of population that's African American, or, or uh, indigenous, um, then you're considered more vulnerable intrinsically. And we don't do that because while equity, racial equity, gender equity uh, uh, is very, very important, the ethnicity or race of somebody isn't the intrinsic driver of likelihood of loss. Um, there are systemic factors for that. And, if, and it's important to recognize that it changing and Fixing those systemic factors should have a positive impact on the overall vulnerability of your jurisdiction. Um, but if you're leaning on 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 uh, intrinsic variables like race and race and ethnicity as your primary drivers to identify vulnerability, and they are nationally the primary drivers, then it puts us in a bit of a, a bit of a bind because we can't do anything to actually address the vulnerability. Um, nothing will change the score that you get out on the other end. And we know that people like to see improvements in scores when they make investments. And so what we do is we look at variables that are associated with loss. These are things like wealth um, as, and things like uh, uh, disability, age. Um, these are, are, are Some of these are accessibility factors. Some of these are, are, are factors of, of, um, of uh, what you call capability. Um, home ownership status, uh, um, the uh, insurance rate, rate of, of having insurance. Um, we actually use a number of the value, val, uh, variables in the resilience analysis planning tool or uh, risk assess analysis planning tool. I, I forget what the RAPT stands for, um, but uh, we use those variables because they are split, it, split out by census track instead of being con combined into a single annex. Because one of the other elements of this is that it's very important for us to understand the root causes of loss and the individual kind of customized intersection of vulnerability variables and how that relates to a given hazard. So earthquake is the drivers behind earthquake risk and law of loss include medical comorbidities like for example being a dialysis patient because we won't have roads and we won't have electricity we won't have clean water so you can't get dialysis so that's very bad um, and we have to plan for how we're going to evacuate the 3500 dialysis patients in King County. Or uh, when you're looking at questions of like who's more likely to suffer losses, it's going to be people in, in older buildings um, are most likely to suffer fatalities um, because older buildings are, uh, le are lower code, more likely to be to fail. So building quality matters a lot. And we combine that with things that are likely that are, that are functions of recovery likelihood. And we say, well, what is the, so does someone have their, have insurance? Well, probably not have earthquake insurance in Washington state. Most people don't. Um, and, um, but do they have other forms of insurance, medical insurance? And then we look at other things. Uh, we might look at other things like transportation. We might look, and we'll look at the proximity to a physical hazard. And that's one of, that's how we can look at risk and vulnerability. We then overlay equity uh, measures like the, the num number, I think I'm running out of time. So that's good. Um, and then we, overlay, we then overlay equity numbers, and that gives us our ability to effectively um, assess the places that are most likely to have benefits, and then we choose uh, infrastructure investments accordingly. Uh, with that, um, I think I'm at my time, um, so thank you very much. Very much appreciate your presentation, Derek. I think you know this has hopefully inspired a number of the participants to think about how they can expand on their mitigation planning strategies. Uh, I really appreciate how much King County thought about all the different factors that go into the process, uh, moving beyond the traditional approaches. And, and I think that's paid off based on what you shared with us today. Uh, we did have a question that popped up. Uh, we're, we're a little short on time, so uh, I'm not going to jump on that right now, but uh, perhaps you could respond to that in the Q&A, Derek, and, and if we have a little bit of time at the end, we can continue to have those questions. Um, what we'll do now is switch over to our final presenter, uh, Lisa Foster. Lisa is a certified floodplain manager with a Master's of Science in Water Resources Engineering. 
and 15 years of experience in watershed and floodplain management planning and education. Uh, Lisa is the floodplain administrator for Pinellas County, Florida, as well as the vice chair of the Florida Floodplain Managers Association and past president of the Florida Local Environmental Resources Agencies. Uh, she serves on multiple committees for both organizations and for the Association of State Floodplain Managers, as well as serving as the chair of the Planning and Zoning Board for her, her hometown. Uh, Lisa manages Pinellas, Pinellas County's Comprehensive Floodplain Management Program and NFIP Community Rating System Program participation. Uh, with all of her great work, she was awarded the National Award for Excellence in uh, Community Rating Systems uh, by FEMA in 2018 for her extensive work with the real estate industry and partnerships with communities across Florida. Lisa, I am sure you have some great uh, experiences and guidance to share with us today. We look forward to your presentation. So it's all yours. Thanks, Kevin. And thank everybody for uh, having me here today on this panel. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the uh, Pinellas County Vulnerability Assessment, uh, which, which follows Derek's presentation nicely. Uh, a little bit about Pinellas County to start. Uh, we have about a million people here, and uh, that's not including our, our visitors, our tourists. And we have almost 600 miles of coastline. Um, we have a very proactive capital planning program, and we have been looking at sea level rise scenarios with those projects for the past few years, um, but saw a need to kind of expand on that, which is where this, this project came about. Um, we're looking forward to adaptation planning now and focusing on some resilient community strategies. Um, we recently, I guess it's been a couple of years now, hired a resiliency and sustainability director who's taking the lead on a, a plan from that end, which will obviously use some of the information that comes from this program. Um, we were also recently awarded a grant to do a flood mitigation uh, plan. So we're gonna collect some additional data uh, lowest floor elevations and some precipitation modeling with that one. So all, all these different things that we're doing all kind of tie together. Um, this is a picture of the blue sky flooding that we're already experiencing here in Pinellas County. Um, Noah's calling it high tide flooding now. Um, in this particular case that you see in the photo, the, the, the seawater backed up through the stormwater infrastructure and we wanted to make sure that we incorporated that that piece rather than do the bathtub model we want to incorporate that piece of sea level rise into the study so the assets were were included in the analysis um, that we did um, overland flooding obviously is also a potential if we have low sea walls or just low-lying area and and those high tides or king tides come come up over the land um, right now it's more of a a disruption so much um, than damaging, uh, but moving forward, obviously, it's, it's going to cause uh, infrastructure damage and damage to the older homes that are down on the ground and things like that. Um, so we needed to uh, develop some data that could guide the decisions on the risks here in the county uh, and address some recognized uncertainties with, with where things are going here. Uh, we really just needed a, a data-driven framework for for driving those decisions that we need to make moving forward um, and create the capability for conducting risk assessments for the existing and the future assets that we have. Um, there were several goals uh, in this plan. Uh, first thing was to identify the assets that are exposed to climate hazards. And we looked at two things, both the depth of the flooding and the duration of the flooding. Um, and we looked at different types of flooding. Uh, we also needed to determine the consequences of of the impacts on, on the costs of those infrastructure that we're looking at um, and took a look at some depth to damage functions. So, you know, how deep can it be and what's the cost of the damage based on how deep it is and how long it how long it's inundated. Um, and then we need to prioritize uh, the assets uh, for, for a plan. So, you know, what's the cost benefit analysis uh, say to make the bridge higher? Um, and this goes back to what Derek talked about, you know, it's not a road or a bridge, it's, it's what it serves. You know, what is the vulnerability of that particular asset? And, you know, these are just some of the assets that, that we're talking about here. It could be that road or that bridge, but who is that road or bridge serving? Do we have a quarter million people on a barrier island that are gonna be severely impacted if the main road on the island and the bridge to the island washes out? Obviously that would be a highly vulnerable situation compared to um, an inland uh, flooding 
not inland, still impacted by sea level rise, but a more inland uh, area, not on a barrier island, where you could still access it um, once you repair the road. So the exposure factors that we looked at, um, obviously sea level rise, and this was through the, the CSAP and NOAA data. Um, the Tampa Bay Climate Science Advisory Panel in 2019 updated its recommendations um, for what that sea level rise looks like. Uh, the water levels increased by almost eight inches since 1950 um, down at our St. Pete gauge. Um, there's still some uncertainty as to which one of these curves is, is the one that's going to best represent sea level rise here. But if we look down at 2021, um, we can see that we're right around that, that eight inches um, over here. So uh, we can see that we've got anywhere from about a half a foot to almost two feet. Um, and then we've got from two to almost nine, one and a half to almost five feet of sea level rise up here in 2070. And if you try to put this in perspective, I mean, we're, we're looking at infrastructure here, but when, when I first received some of this data, I automatically started thinking about, well, if we have residents building houses today, what does that look like, you know, in 50 years from now, you know, in 30 years from now, that's, that's the mortgage period, right? And then what about 50 years from now or even 75? Because you would anticipate that building to last for at least 50 years. So uh, we also looked under the exposure at the depth and the duration of just the tidal flooding. So it's just sea level rise, no rainfall on it, no storm surge on it. How many hours per year um, uh, will these things uh, be inundated? Um, we looked at the intermediate low, the intermediate and the high scenarios for that. And then we also looked at different time horizons. So we looked at the 2040, 2070 and 2100 um, time scenarios. And then we also looked at different storm surge scenarios, um, the 25, the 50, the 100, the 250 and the 500 year storm events. So there's a lot of data that came out of this. We've got how many hours per year of inundation, um, which curve, are we talking about? Are we talking about the low, the intermediate, or the high curve? And then you add storm surge on top of that to run the storm surge scenarios. So you might have a 2040, 100 year storm um, based on the intermediate sea level rise condition as your antecedent condition um, that is expected to occur for one hour per year. So that would be your, your king tide. Um, that's going to come in and go out maybe just a, a couple of times a year because it's only going to reach that level of inundation for that one hour per year. So in 2040, with a 100 year storm on top of that sea level rise scenario with an intermediate curve, what does that storm surge look like? And that was done for all these different storms for all these different years out. So we uh, recently got the results. This is uh, the current conditions. So we had a baseline storm surge model that was done. Um, the scientists that worked on, on the probability portion of this um, is a NASA climatologist and used some new climate model to come up with that probability storm or for all those probability storms for all the different storm scenarios that we ran. So this is the current condition 2018 um, just this isn't, this is not the, um, I'm sorry, this is not storm surge. This is just a sea level rise extent for 2040. And then this is it in 2040. If you can see the, let me zoom in on it. Oh good, there's another piece. So if you can see this area, we see that the extent and the duration of the flooding here is increased. Uh, this image just shows you the mean high high in 2100 and then the flooding for the one hour per year. So this is going to be less time per year and this is going to be, I'm sorry, this is more hours per year, just a regular mean high high water versus that king king tide that I was talking about. Just one hour per year, the water is going to come in and go out. So you can see this whole area up here is inundated and that of course is directed by the um, pipes. Um, over here, we've got the yellow representing uh, the deeper flooding, and this is Indian Rocks Beach. So we can see that all of this area is going to be inundated just with your mean high, high tides in 2040. We're already seeing this now, though, uh, not quite to that extent, but we are already seeing this. So this is the storm surge. So now we've overlaid the storm surge on top of those sea level rise scenarios, and this is dynamic modeling. This, this is not... Um, just bathtub modeling where you just add three feet to whatever your, whatever it, it said it was for current conditions. So the storm surge model was done by the University of Florida uh, and our consultant checked it. Um, he's with WSP. So it's a pretty robust analysis. 
And uh, you can see here that, again, we've got this area where we're having higher, higher storm surge encroaching further inland. So, you know, as we move forward with the sea level rise condition and with the climatic changes of future storm projections, we're seeing increased flooding, which is, is to be expected. Uh, so this is the intermediate sea level rise scenario, and we can see the different how many hours per year. So this is gonna be your more common flooding, and this is going to be your least common flooding, just blue sky flooding. So just your, your high tides. And then when you throw a storm surge on top of that, you can see obviously the 500 year event is going to extend further inland and be deeper. So you can see the, the bright green over here for your 50 year storm. And I'm gonna move this forward. And then here's the 2100, so you can see it encroaching in further. You can see the difference, it comes in over here where it was not before. And you can see it come further in down here as well. So all those storms, when you look at those future conditions are, are gonna be a greater inundation timing and depth and area. Um, this is uh, an area down in St. Pete Beach. This is just a 2040 high scenario for sea level rise. And interestingly enough, these are the areas where we had flood insurance claims from a tropical storm that we had last November, Tropical Storm Ada. Uh, a lot of the, the streets were flooded, but we also have a lot of older homes over here on the Barrier Islands and um, over on the east side in Tampa Bay, in St. Petersburg, and then down in Gulfport. We had a lot of flooding uh, to these older homes that are down on the ground, uh, probably two or three feet of water just from that little tropical storm that didn't even hit us. It was, it was off the coast and went north of us. Um, this is, uh, these are just some pictures from Tropical Storm Ada. And it's, it's just very interesting how when you ground truth that these areas that flooded align with those future conditions from sea level rise. Uh, granted, this was a storm surge event, not a sea level rise event, but you can kind of visualize from the water level from this storm, you know, get that picture in your head about what that map actually, actually represents. Um, so the 2070, which one's this one? We're, we're 2070 with the intermediate low sea level rise scenario, which is gonna be the lowest of the three scenarios. This is that same area. You still see streets flooded. So, you know, these folks over here might need to check the tides before they go grocery shopping in 2070. Um, if they build their house elevated, they may not, may not flood from a high tide, but they're going to need to plan around the tides. So, you know, we need to look at these things and these assets and, and come up with mitigation strategies for those which is what the next steps are. <laughs> so we took a look at what the vulnerabilities are. We have the sea level rise data. We have the storm surge data for all those different scenarios. And we're looking at those. And now we need to take a look at what the impact, what's the vulnerability of that asset? What are the consequences of, of a failure of that particular asset? What's the cost benefit of actually doing something to build it you know, stronger or higher to bridge more piles, piles deeper, you know, higher elevation of the whatever it might be for that particular asset you know what's the cost benefit of that and what are some adaptation strategies and you know these backflow preventers the tide check valve here this is one of the duckbill ones uh will prevent that high tide from coming in and flooding but what if it's raining at high tide where does that fresh water go so now you have this whole other animal and and you know people are talking about raising seawalls and and doing all these different things um, but if you're raising seawalls and you're bringing in fill and you have a preventer from that storm surge or not storm surge, the tide coming backwards in, where is all that rainwater runoff going to go if, if it happens to rain at high tide? So there are other things that need to be looked at. Um, this is a picture of um, is this Indian Rocks Beach again. Oh, it says Bel Air Beach. Sorry, Bel Air Beach. And they're already installing some uh, check valves at key locations. And um, they, they were talking about pumps. I'm not sure where, where they are with that right now, but they had some quite frequent blue sky flooding there. So they have installed some of these backflow preventer valves. This is the 2040 um, high scenario. The yellow is the deeper flooding um, and the purple is the shorter duration flooding. Um, uh, one hour per year, but it's most extensive. So, you know, the tide might come in and then go back out. So the orange and yellow areas are the ones that'll be wet longer. So this is an example um, from Tropical Storm Ada. This particular manufactured home park flooded very badly with Ada and it's, it's not waterfront. It's near the water, but it's not waterfront. It's on Tampa Bay. 
on the Tampa Bay side of the county, um, check valves aren't even an option here because this is, it was overland flow coming in from the Bay because it's just a very low lying area. Uh, if we put a seawall in, how high can you go and what happens to the runoff from the relatively large catchment that flows through and over this area? Um, and, you know, you can elevate the structures, but again, what about the vehicles? What about the cars? Um, you know, the asphalt's not going to survive being inundated for, for too much time, and it will only worsen with sea level rise. So do we need to look at retreat as an option? Um, so this vulnerability assessment in tandem with our resiliency planning efforts and our new floodplain uh, management action plan um, will all kind of come together and tie into our comprehensive plan and our local mitigation strategy and other things that we're doing. Um, and I really hope what comes out of this study is uh, enough data to point us in the right direction to maybe take a look at our building codes. You know, are we actually um, having a floodplain ordinance that makes sense that is, is going to be requiring an elevation high enough to withstand a flood in the amount of time that that structure is supposed to survive. So if I build a house today, like I said, and it should last 50 years, we need to make sure those lowest floor elevations are up above that 50 year, 100, 100 50 year out, 100 year storm surge. <laughs> it's a lot of numbers. <laughs> and uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Well, Lisa, I really appreciate the presentation. I think what you shared is going to be very valuable to uh, coastal communities for certain, but but I think anyone that has flood-related impacts, uh, you know, could be related to this. Um, we have a question. We have just a couple minutes for questions, so let me throw a couple of them at you. Um, Byron asks, uh, are the dynamic flooding modeling tools publicly available that you used? So University of Florida did the study. Uh, the models themselves were not were not provided to us, we got the results, we got the data packages, and we haven't pushed them out externally yet. We're, we're at that point where we're kind of sifting through all the data right now and figuring out, you know, what kind of actions we need to take. I did um, do some, I grabbed a few scenarios and, and did kind of that rounding to a one foot and did a jet, had our JS group make an application to overlay just a 2070 storm surge for 100 year, um, the current conditions. Uh, 500 year, the current conditions, 100 year storm surges uh, with our FEMA maps and our FEMA preliminary maps. Uh, we have new maps coming that'll go effective at the end of the summer. And that was just distributed to the municipal floodplain managers. We have 24 municipalities here. So we're all just kind of trying to digest this data and figure out how we how we need to address our floodplain ordinances to make sure we're on the same page. So we do have an external application that I sent to the floodplain managers, but it's not this whole data set. And it's not the model. It is a kind of smoothed out polygon vector <laughs> uh, rounded to a whole foot of three storm scenarios. <laughs> wow. Uh, we have another question from Chris. Uh, he wants to know if you can speak to how you plan on incorporating your sea level rise projections and vulnerability assessment and also possible uh, higher regulatory standards like uh, treating coastal A zones like V zones uh, into your next CRS submittal. So we will present the information to our commissioners and kind of get a read on where they want to go with it. And I will provide them with a few different options. Obviously, V-Zone regs in a coastal A-Zone is, is one of the things on the list. Um, I have some concerns about the commercial portion of that. Uh, I see... I see the residential making sense, right? Because a person is gonna be displaced if that structure doesn't withstand the wave action. Um, but a commercial structure, I believe they should have an opportunity at least to try to engineer that flood proofing option. So we may do some sort of hybrid situation. Um, I'm not sure yet. I've got a lot of data pulled together into a lot of slides and I need to vet through that with our leadership. We got one final question uh, from Daniel, and Daniel, I really like this question because it, it pulls together how we uh, collaborate across organizations, which I think is a theme we all are, are very much aware of and support. Um, Daniel asks, in regard to the analysis work that you've done, are you using those analyses to give a head start to the emergency operations centers uh, for doing predetermination of areas that they need to focus on for outreach, uh, for damage assessment post-event, for helping speed up uh, damage assessment declarations and so forth. Uh, how are you connecting the dots? Absolutely. So obviously we have the, you know, the slosh and the meows and the moms and all these things. So our emergency management 
department recently ran all the directionals for a bunch of different storm scenarios. So now if we have something coming in, we can take a look at what is the projected forward speed, what is the projected direction, and we have those runs to take a look at what the anticipated impact might be. Now, in addition to that, we have the vulnerability analysis. I showed you the, comp the comparison of here's the 2040 sea level rise. We can see where it's gonna get wet. So we know that those areas are gonna get wet with a directional storm from, from the emergency management models. So we need to have those models kind of talk to each other so that we can use our, it's called alert Pinellas, but you know, the Everbridge system to push out to those parcels that we expect to get wet from a particular direction and, and speed storm uh, so that they have a heads up that something, something may cause flooding in their neighborhood. Well, thank you very much, Lisa, and thank you all of our presenters, as well as those of you who asked questions and took the time to attend this uh, terrific session. I learned a lot. I hope that's true of all of you. Uh, I think it was a great use of time and um, look forward to actually applying this information going forward. Uh, Terry, do you want to take us home? I sure do. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, our presenters have been working in the background and have been typing answers to all your questions. I appreciate how engaged everyone has been. I, I think we had some tremendous speakers today. Um, so I want to thank them again. I was able to witness uh, in preparation for this session how incredibly busy and dedicated these speakers are. So we're genuinely honored and grateful that you took the time to share your stories with us today. So what's next? Um, Inspire, we still have an, the, the rest of the day. We have a couple live sessions after this, the National Roundtable on Emerging Technology for Preparedness. So this roundtable session has a great track record of um, at our summits in the past. So we always pull together speakers on emerging technology, which means it is happening and something that will be available to support you in the near future or provides key takeaways for your own mission. So we think these are all things that you should be aware of. Um, and definitely not a session to miss. And then at three Eastern, we have our open community forum on COVID-19 best practices in health medical resource management. And this is another great panel of local and national level SMEs, and just a great opportunity to share your experiences and to learn about emerging best practices in managing health and medical resources during COVID-19 response and for future high consequence public health events. And finally, to close out our Inspire event, we'll be hosting a happy hour in Geography B. Now, I know this cannot replace the traditional social experience we get at Inspire in person, but we've been hosting these uh, virtual happy hours and trivias for uh, the last year. And it will be a fun way for us all to come back together, see some familiar faces and participate in the Geography B or just come out, hang and enjoy some fellowship and laugh. So we hope we will see you there. Thanks again for your time. Looking forward to seeing you all in the next session. Take care.